Must a Gentile become a Jew in order to become a Christian? So I read that that doesn't have a whole lot to do with us today. And you're right, it doesn't. But in the first century, in the first century around Israel or Judea and around the areas where the Apostle Paul and the other apostles went preaching, it was a very important question. It was the theological question of the day. And for the churches in Galatia, it was particularly important because the Jewish people there, uh, a lot of them who were ethnic Jews who had become Christians had been uh, trying to force some of the ethnic Gentiles who are becoming Christians to become Jews first. They'd have to obey the law of Moses. The men would need to be circumcised. But they, they would have to do that first. And the Apostle Paul, of course, is, it is arguing against that. And, and correctly, he's arguing that the, the Gentiles were never obligated to follow the law of Moses. Even before the death of Jesus on the Christ, on the cross, in that Old Testament period, the law was given to the children of Israel. It was given to the Jews. But the law was given about 430 years after a lot of promises were made to Abraham that in Abraham's seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And to be blessed on the account, so to speak, of Abraham for the same reason that Abraham was blessed. And that was because of his faith. Faith makes the big difference in our lives. Faith will lead us to obedience to God. Faith will lead us to a right relationship with God. Faith will lead us into an everyday trusting in the power of God to bring about His will in our lives. So we want to look at this today in the sense of what was going on with the children of Israel or with, with the Jews uh, and, and the Gentiles in the sense of, of why. why. Why is this argument there? It was clear from the Old Testament and it's repeated in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 in the form of an argument. You know, if the Gentiles who did not have the law were doing the things that the law said to do, have they not become a law to themselves? In other words, in that patriarchal era when it was uh, with, the, with the moral aspects of the law, that it was wrong to kill, it was wrong to steal, it was wrong to bear false witness. All of those things, they transcend the different covenants that man might be under. So when the Gentiles did not kill, shed innocent blood, when they did not steal, when they did not bear false witness, when they were doing that because they knew that there was a God and they trusted in that God and they worshipped that God, then they to themselves were doing something that the Jews who had the law very seldom did. Because the law brought things to them. But what we want to look at this morning, in particular, is the curse of the law. Again, the promise of the Gentiles being accepted in Christianity, and that goes back to Abraham, 430 years before the law, that all nations would be blessed. Just not Israel, but all nations would be blessed by that seed who would come. The law of Moses was nailed to the cross when Jesus was crucified. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 talks about that. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 talks about that. But the moral precepts the transcendent precepts that go beyond that, that were established by God, they weren't only in the law of Moses, they were there for the patriarchs. And it's important that we understand that. And they are to be maintained forever. They're to be maintained by us as Christians today. That we are not to shed innocent blood. We're not to steal. We're not to lie. Bear false witness. All of those things are still very crucial for us to honor as a transcendent law of God because they come from God's nature. 
and they come down to us in the form of these covenants. But again, what does Paul mean when he says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. He doesn't mean that he has taken away all law. There are a lot of people that teach that today. They said that, well, you know, before it was law and now it's grace. We don't have any law. We don't have anything to obey today. We don't have anything to do today. And they're wrong in that. But we can see that from what is taught in the New Testament. We are still under law today. It's just we're not under the law of Moses. And we're not under the covenant of the patriarchs. We're under law and we're under covenant to Jesus Christ who has redeemed us from those laws. He's taken them away and he's established one new one. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 tells us that we are to help one another, bear one another's burdens, and when we do that, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. You say, wait a minute. Law of Christ? There is no law. We're under grace. No. The New Testament says there is a law of Christ. Now this law is a little bit different. And we'll see that as we go down through the lesson. But yet, there is a law of Christ. James chapter 1, verse 25. James calls the Word of God the perfect law of liberty. Which we should abide in. Which means we should do. We should accomplish it. Well, how is it a law of liberty? Well, liberty means freedom. It frees us from something. It frees us from the burden of, of not knowing uh, that uh, we have a God who has gone to the cross to die there for us. It frees us from sin. It frees us from guilt. We'll develop that a little bit more. But yet, it's a law. And it's perfect. And it brings us to God. Kelion, the Greek word there for perfect, means, can mean perfect, mature, and finished. And I think what James is trying to tell us there, it's the finished law of liberty. It's the completed law of liberty. It's the capstone, so to speak. Back here in the times when, when, when man was separated from God because of sin, uh, there, were, there was a patriarchal covenant. There was a, a mosaic covenant that we talk about, the law of Moses. But now that's capped off by something that is complete. It's fulfilled. It's perfect. It finishes those other things and brings man the perfect opportunity to live at liberty. To be able to walk with God hand in hand is the song that we were singing. Now, the way we understand that's figurative. But we need to be walking hand in hand with God today. That, that's, how, that's the type of relationship that God wants with us. Therefore, the Apostle John could say in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, Blessed are those who do His commandments, talking about Jesus, that they may have right to the tree of life and they may enter through the gates into the city. Before, that was not possible. Before Christ died upon the cross, it was not possible Man did not and could not have the right to eat of the tree of life. The, the Jews and the Gentiles both, neither one of them would have that right. And, and neither of them would be able to enter into the gates of the city. It's not until Jesus came and died upon the cross that that perfect law of liberty then comes into play. And now we have the right, we have the freedom to eat of the tree of life, to enter into the gates of the city because of what He has done for us. The law of Moses and that patriarchal covenant had no mechanism for remitting sins. When they took that animal, that innocent animal, that perfect, blemishless, spotless animal, and took it to the altar and slit its throat and 
cut it up and burned it on that altar. And they spread that blood all around. That did not forgive anybody of their sins. It couldn't. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to remit sin, to take away sin. It, it, it just wasn't the right thing for doing it. When we sin, even as Christians, please note that, when we sin, the law not only condemns us, it stands between us and God. So there it is. How many... You think of it in this way. Here I am and I have this right relationship with God. But then I sin. And what happens? I'm separated from God. And here comes this mountain. Right up in between. And that's the law. And the law that condemns me. The law that says, here's what sin is. And you've done this, therefore you are a sinner. Now you are separated from God. And the law that says that, back at the time of the patriarchs and back at the time of the Jews, the Mosaic Law, there is no mechanism for getting that mountain out of the way. The law stood in the way. The law said, the wages of sin is death. You deserve to die because you have sinned. And there is no way to get over that mountain, around that mountain, under that mountain, through that mountain. That's simply how it was till Jesus died on the cross. And when He died on the cross, He shed His blood, and that takes our sin away. And when He takes the sin away, that mountain dissolves. And we, once again, have fellowship with God. We are brought back together. Now, not just because He died on the cross, but because we respond to that by faith. We trust in that sacrifice. We trust in His blood. And His blood dissolves, it takes away, it brings us back to a right relationship with Him. As Christians, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. See how that works? The curse of the law. The law was there. You sin, you deserve to die, and there's nothing that's going to bring you back to God. But see, God had promised all along that something would happen. That He would make that supreme sacrifice. It goes back clear to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He talks about it as He talks with Abraham. He doesn't make mention of the uh, sacrifice, but He talks about how all nations would be blessed in His seed. And we'll get to that in a moment. But understand this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law. If you sin, you deserve to die. What is the curse of the law? Okay. It's physical, spiritual, and eternal death. They are all demanded by sin as defined by God's law. And it doesn't matter if you were in the patriarchal covenant under that, under the Mosaic covenant and the law of Moses, or whether you are under covenant to Jesus Christ. It is the same. If we sin, then we deserve to die. We are already separated from God. Now, are we going to be separated from God for the rest of our lives and for eternity? That would depend upon what we do or what we allow the blood of Christ to do in our lives. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law that God be thanks, or thank, uh, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of jiving in the old King James and the new King James together. The strength, the, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. And it builds up, and it's there, and it's standing between us. You can't get rid of the law. You can't get rid of, you shall not shed innocent blood, you shall not steal, you shall not 
bear false witness, lie. You can't get rid of those, can you? You can't get rid of those without destroying God. Now, a lot of people try to do it. I don't believe in God, so therefore I don't believe that there's anything that's necessarily right or wrong. You've heard the arguments here lately, haven't you? And the point of Jesus dying upon the cross wasn't to get rid of God's moral law that these things are wrong. It was to get rid of the sin that separates you and me from God. Sinners can be redeemed from the curse of the law whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles. The majority of us today are Gentiles. But it still holds true if we want to be saved, if we want to have our sins forgiven, and we want to be rejoined or reconciled to God, then we have to have those sins taken away to receive the blessings enumerated in the law then the curse of the law has to be taken away. Now, did you catch that? Do you understand that? It's not the law so much that's taken out of the way. Now, we know that, that the law of Moses was nailed on the cross. Yes, the law of Moses is taken out of the way. We don't have to deal with that anymore. But that transcendent moral law that descends to us from the very nature of God is always going to be there. And there's a curse in it that says when we disobey God, then we are under the curse of the law. And that's what we need to have taken away to receive the blessings that are under the law. Yeah, there are blessings in the law. There are blessings. Yeah. If we obey God and trust God, what does He do? We have fellowship with Him. He, he gives us peace. He gives us comfort in time of need. He provides for our needs. All of those things are there. But there are cursings also. And the cursing is when He curses us and the law curses us when we do wrong. And those things, in particular what we talk about, will always be wrong. Resurrection to a spiritual life, resurrection to eternal life is the blessing that God wants to give to each and every one of us when He takes away the curse of the law. No matter what law you are under, He will take the curse away. But the law remains. The law remains, and we still have to honor that law but He takes away the curse. Sinners can be redeemed from the curse of the law. We are in one kingdom under Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, how did He do that? Read on down in Galatians chapter 3. Start at verse 26. The same apostle who tells us that, that we have been freed from the curse of the law tells us how we get to be freed from the curse of the law. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise was that? The, the, the promise that God had made to Abraham back there, that all nations would be blessed in his seed. Just seed, not seeds. This one, this one, this Messiah who came to die on the cross for us. Jesus Christ, the Word who came flesh and dwelt among us. His blood takes away that curse of the law. And, and what are the blessings then that we receive? When, when His blood dissolves that curse of the law that stands between us, reconciles us to God because of our obedience, well, what, what change takes place? Galatians chapter 5, verse, verses 19 through 21. 
First of all, listen to this. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dis, uh, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Those were the things that stood between us and God. Whichever ones of these we have committed, they stand between us and God and don't allow us to have a, a, a right relationship with Him. And I, I, I like how Paul kind of ends that list. And the like. Listen, these are not the only things. Because a lot of it is attitude. The attitude that we have toward these things. The attitude that we have toward God. The attitude that we have toward one another. All applies into this. These things curse us regardless of the law. And Paul says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, and though, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ that we just talked about there in Galatians chapter 3, those who do these things, they, they, they may have obeyed the gospel, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Because sin, those sins, that, that brings the curse once again to those who do such things. What is it we want to inherit? Well, in the, this one kingdom of God, the kingdom that God is giving to us, wants us to inherit. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and what we have then, starting with verse 22, listen to this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. There's no law against doing what is good and what is right, what is proper, what God has asked you to do. And, and if you will do these things because the, the Spirit is involved in your life, the, the Spirit working through the Word, God working through the providential means of life, the, the growth, the maturity that you have, these things. Which would you rather have in your life? Now, uh, you probably all hold up your hand and say, well, I want those, that fruit of the Spirit in my life. But do we really? Go back and look at that other list. Are there times when we want some of these things in our life? Is there some times when we want to practice these things? Oh, I, I want to go to heaven, but yet I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that a little bit, or this a little bit. That brings the curse of the law right back to us. If you are practicing these things, these in, in chapter in, in verse 22 and 24, there's no law against them. This is what doing God's moral law brings into your life. The fruit of the Spirit. The peace, the joy, the love, all of these things. Since these are not against God's law, there's no curse associated with them. Those who practice these things, they're blessed. They're blessed. They've had that curse of sin, a, a curse of the law dissolved. They're reconciled to God by the blood of Christ. And they're walking in the light as He is in the light. And the fruit of the Spirit is there in their lives. It can't be missed. They're going to inherit the kingdom of God when this life is over. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law? The law of Moses. He's talking specifically about the law of Moses here. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, that means as a sacrifice for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Did you catch that? The law condemned sin. Or, okay, let me explain it a little bit. The law of Moses and God's law to the Gentiles, the patriarchal law, Catch this because this is important. When a person sinned, it condemned the flesh. 
and condemn the flesh. The wages of sin is death. He who does these things is worthy of death. That's what the law says, the, the law of Moses and that law, the patriarchal law of the Gentiles. But through his sacrificial death, Jesus placed the curse on sin. On the sin. Catch that? You see the difference? With the old, the curse was on the flesh. But with what Jesus has done, the curse is on the sin. And in shedding His blood, He sanctifies us, He blesses us. All those who by faith repent are baptized with the remission of sins and who walk according to the Spirit. Not according to the flesh. Not according to those old things that, that caused the, the law to become a curse. He's dissolved. If we walk in those things, yes, we will still receive the curse of the law. But if we allow the blood of Christ into our lives to take that curse away, then we walk in the Spirit, we walk in that perfect law of liberty. We are redeemed from the, redeemed from the curse of the law by faith in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who by His sacrifice became a curse for us. So here's the, the question we ask this morning. Are you under the curse of the law? Or are you under the blessing of Christ's redemption? You say, well, I, I don't know. How, how, how could I tell? Well, just go back. Have you become a child of God? Have you put Christ on in baptism? Do you believe that He's the Son of God to make that possible? Or not? And that curse of the law remains there with you. If you're not in Christ, you're under the curse of the law. If you're not obeying Christ through the Spirit-led life, you are under the curse of the law. And there's only one way to come out from under that curse. Same as offered on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that brings the joy, the love, the peace, the patience, all of those things into your life. Reconciles you back to God. To walk with where are you at today? Are you under the curse? Or are you under the blessings of Jesus Christ? If you have need today, whether it's repentance, baptism, and remission of sins, whether it's an erring child of God desiring to return to the fold, please come take a seat here in front of us and sing the invitation song.